third to the third uh, discussion in our series sponsored by Nefcure Kidney International and Trevier Therapeutics. We at Black Health Matters presents Living Your Best Life. So we've been discussing these previous two uh, discussions. We've been talking about FSGS and chronic kidney disease and its effect on uh, a disproportionate effect on the African American community. My name is Kevin Mott, and I am here actually wearing three hats. I am a board member of Nefcura Kidney International. I am a member of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated, which is also a partner in tonight's discussion through our Healthy Kappa's Healthy Community uh, uh, Initiative. And I am an FSGS patient as well. Uh, my journey with FSGS was 2002, wherein I found myself dealing with migraines and, and other illnesses. And as I tried to find solutions along the way, I discovered that I was, uh, pardon me, I was diagnosed with FSGS. Uh, I, my journey was much, much better than most people. Uh, it was not easy. It was pretty difficult at, at times, but from 2002 through to 2017, when I received a kidney transplant from a good friend of mine, a uh, good college friend of mine, uh, I never had to go on dialysis. I was able to manage my condition and uh, really the whole time, I knew that the experience I was having, although difficult, was much better than most other people. And uh, because I had a long time between my diagnosis and finally getting a transplant, and I got a transplant in July of 2017. And since then I have been doing very well. Uh, my FSGS has stayed in remission, but I knew I was very fortunate. I knew I was very blessed. And as much as I could, I tried to live my best life the whole entire time. So tonight, what we're going to talk about is living your best life while dealing with FSGS or chronic kidney disease, whether it's you as a patient or you taking care of someone. And to do that, we have two excellent and dynamic speakers tonight. So I'm gonna tell you about one speaker who's going to join us a little bit later. His name is Mark Cornell. He's a Los Angeles native. He's a former amateur boxer turned personal trainer. And at 26, he was diagnosed with FSGS, uh, which is a, a rare kidney disease that, that attacks your kidneys, scars your cells, and makes it difficult for your kidneys to function properly. Um, he was on dialysis from December 2018 through December of 2019. And on December 10th of 2019, he received a kidney transplant. What has been driving him and motivating him since then has been interviewing uh, patients advocating and motivating. He has a podcast called The Kidney Fighter Show, and he is a very dynamic and exciting guy, and I'm, you're going to enjoy getting to know him a little bit later. Our first guest is going to be Sashay Walker, or as we know her, Chef, Chef Sashay. She's a private chef from Chicago who's recently re relocated to Michigan. In January of 2017, her eight-year-old son, Aiden, was diagnosed with FSGS, and his kidney function declined quickly uh, after many failed attempts, attempts at treatment. By July 2017, he was on hemodialysis four days a week. And at, after many attempts and complications with PD dialysis due to his other health complications, he ended up remaining on hemodialysis until he received a kidney transplant in July of 2018. Unfortunately, within four days of treatment, his FS, FSGS recurred and unfortunately he hasn't gone into remission. Uh, and talking to Seth, Chef Sachet earlier, uh, I know that he, is a, he has a great attitude. He is a very curious, intelligent and wonderful child and they have been working on this condition together. So I'd like to bring to you Seth, Seth Chassay and I'm very excited about our segment this evening because Two things that are very important to me, I, I cook as a hobby. I would never claim to be a professional chef, but I can handle my own. And also I like to work out. I like to exercise. It, it's been very good for me. So chef, welcome. And I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you uh, so much for having me. I'm so excited to be a part of this Net Cure initiative with Black Health Matters. Um, as uh, Kevin stated, my son, Aiden, who's now 12, um, struggles with FSGS, and he did receive 
a kidney transplant a few years ago, but even with receiving the kidney transplant, we still do weekly infusions of albumin and Lasix and plasmapheresis in order to maintain his kidney health. So being a private chef and a chef instructor, I really found my passion in understanding the parts of this disease that we can control. And the interesting thing about FSGS is because it attacks our community, our African-American community, where food is so indigenous to who we are as a people, I made it my plan to figure out how we could still eat well while battling this disease. So what I'm gonna do for you guys today is gonna, I'm gonna talk to you guys a little bit about ways to make living with this disease a little bit easier in terms of the diet. Um, when he was diagnosed with FSGS, we immediately were assigned to a dietitian who told us, you know, don't eat fried food, stay away from eating out a lot, don't let him have this, no more pizza and french fries, thing like, thing, things like that. And um, to be honest, it's really hard for an eight-year-old to understand why they can't have pizza and french fries. Um, so what I did was I tried to work with the dietitian on a regular basis to figure out what it meant to be on a low sodium diet, low potassium, low phosphorus. And what that allowed me to do is I took those resources and I really started using them as a guide to create meal plans and recipes and just different ways that we could operate in our day-to-day -day life around this disease, but still eat tasty food. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you first a little bit about seasoning. So I have a couple of things down here I'm gonna show you. Um, on my cutting board. We're in my home kitchen. Um, it's never this clean. So I'm, I'm so excited to show it off to you guys. Um, but the first thing I want to talk to you about is understanding what low potassium, low phosphorus, and low, um, low sodium really are. So sodium is the salt intake. Phosphorus and potassium are minerals that we naturally get from our food. But when you have kidney disease, specifically FSGS, you can't break those things down as well. And they can cause you to, to bloat up with fluid. Um, you swell a lot, not just in your feet and hands, but everywhere. Um, you tend to have higher blood pressures. Your phosphorus and potassium levels are not controlled as well. And they require a lot of medication in order to regulate. So what we want to do is look at what are high potassium and high phosphorus, high sodium things that we need to stay away from. So in terms of sodium and seasonings, stay away from anything that ends in salt, garlic salt, onion salt, anything like that you need to steer clear of because there's already an, a certain amount of sodium, probably 500 milligrams or more per bottle that for most you know, FSGS patients, you can't even have 500 milligrams of sodium ever, uh, let, let, let alone in a serving of something. So stay away from those things. I like to use a lot of dried herbs, a lot of dried vegetables in my seasonings. So the first one that I'm gonna show you, all these recipes, by the way, all these seasonings are on my website. Um, so right here in this bowl right here, I have made like a little handmade seasoning, equal parts onion, um, dehydrated onion, dehydrated garlic, some chili powder, some dehydrated citrus peel. And you can find these seasonings at any grocery store, really. All you have to do is just take equal parts of them, mix them into a container, and they can store in your pantry for like up to six months. They're never gonna last that long. I tend to make seasonings at least every 30 days. Um, but this is a great thing. You can add some fresh pepper to it, some chili flakes, and that's a great way to season your food without salt. It also brings comfort in knowing that you know what is exactly in your food that you're eating. Um, another thing that we use, Dollar Tree will become your best friend when you're making your own seasonings. So these little containers here, I use these for everything. I use them for seasoning blends, for portioning certain things, 
for Aiden and I've gotten pretty much everybody in our household to kind of adjust to this diet. So that's another really great thing about this. It's not expensive at all. You can get cheap storage containers um, and you can make big batches of seasoning blends, especially if you use it a lot. I use this seasoning blend. It's like a chili citrus blend um, pretty much on everything that I make with chicken. It's pretty much become like our poultry seasoning. Um, in the house. If you are cooking for people that do not have kidney disease or that do, if they're all in the same house together, then those that can have the salt, they can add a little salt to their chicken. But you know that you have a seasoning base that's salt free that you don't have to worry about. So that's the first one. The second one is an Italian seasoning blend that you can make all by yourself. This is literally just dried herbs. We have oregano, thyme, parsley, uh, dried basil with a little um, onion powder and garlic powder. That's it. Super, super simple. You can use that on anything. I'm actually using it tonight to make spaghetti. So um, that's another great one. And then I have here in my little bowl, if you can see, all I do is I just take equal parts of all the, all the different herbs. So I have some parsley some onion flake, some dehydrated garlic, oregano, thyme, rosemary, all in here. And I just mix this up and you can store it and use it for whatever you want. The next thing that I wanna to talk to you guys about before we get started on our recipe is infusing olive oils. So I have a background working in restaurants and different catering companies, and we would infuse oils to add as like a finishing for a dish or if you, we wanted to cook something in something for a certain flavor. Um, for those out there that love spice, chili oil will be your best friend. So I, this is a very simple recipe, it's on my website. All it is is chili flakes cooked on low in olive oil. And you can use this to drizzle for a vinaigrette or you can use it to um, you know, cook a little bit of your chicken in if, if you want some heat, but you don't want too much heat. Another one that I use is an herb oil. So this is basil oil. Uh, this is a chopped basil and garlic uh, cooked down with olive oil and cooled. These tend to last um, about 30 to 60 days. I tend to use them so much that they don't last longer than that, but you, but they can last like 90 days or more if you keep them re refrigerated. Um, there's no water in them because the herbs and the garlic and stuff and the peppers are cooked in it. Um, so all there's no, you know, water in it to collect the bacteria. And this one is a simple garlic oil. So you see, I have my chopped garlic down here cooked down into my olive oil. So these are like three really, really great basic oils that you can use to enhance all of your recipes. Chili oil, garlic oil, herb oil. You can even put a little um, dehydrated lemon peel or orange peel um, in here and you can have like a great chef experience every single day. So now we're gonna get to the cooking part. So what I'm going to do for you guys is I'm going to make a um, quick chicken salad that I make at home all the time. So you guys see I have my cutting board here. I'm going to transport you to the Food Network, okay? So first things first, I have my vegetables here, and I made sure that I picked out things that were low potassium and low phosphorus. Remember, because... When you have kidney disease, those are very hard things to control because our kidneys cannot filter them out properly. So I have cucumber here. I have yellow pepper here. I have a nectarine here. And I have some green onion. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to get our veggies chopped and into our little bowl here, okay? So... I'm just going to take a little bit of my cucumber here and always have a garbage bowl with you when you're cooking. I, I have adopted that tip from Rachel Ray, so I have a little garbage bowl here. 
I'm going to bend myself down so that you can see me a little bit. And I love to just peel all my veggies first. So I'm just going to peel my cucumber. I love cucumbers. I could eat a cucumber every single day. So we have that peeled. We're just going to cut this in half. And this is something that you can make ahead of time. And mix up and put it to the side. I'll show you guys also how I kind of meal prep for lunch, especially with all the remote learning that's going on. Nobody's in school all the time um, in person. So I'll show you guys how I kind of store all of these things. I've got my yellow pepper here. I'm just dicing this into small bite-sized pieces. Nothing too crazy. They don't have to be perfect. They just have to be bite-sized. Toss this in my bowl. Now, I've rinsed my nectarine. I'm just going to cut two pieces off of that. And chop it up just like this. And then I'm going to dump this in my bowl. And then I always like a little onion. So I like green onion because it's mild. I'm just going to take a few pieces and chop this up. Add as much as you like or as little as you like. I like a lot of green onion, personally. I put green onions in everything. I put green onions in my scrambled eggs every day. So I'm going to toss that in here. So now what we have in here is all of our mixed veggies, right? We have our nectarine, our cucumber, our yellow pepper, and our green onions. And then we have some chicken here. I grilled some chicken in my poultry seasoning, okay? So now what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna cut up my chicken just like that, okay? And I'm gonna push that to the side, okay? So now the last thing that we're gonna work on is making our vinaigrette. You don't have to overthink making like a salad dressing. It's super, super simple, okay? So, you see I have my bowl here. We're going to use, let's do some chili oil. So I'm just going to squeeze in here about two tablespoons of chili oil like that. And then I'm going to add two tablespoons of our red wine vinegar. Now I am guesstimating because I've done this for a long time, but guess what? I have measuring spoons here too. So don't be ashamed if you need a measuring spoon. Now, in order to get your salad dressing to really like stay together, you need some type of emulsifier, something to kind of hold it together. So I always go for handy dandy honey. One, two, three. Three seconds, that's about two tablespoons. And I'm going to add a dash of lemon juice to that. And as something extra, I think I'm going to add a little bit of my Italian seasoning blend as well to kick it up a little bit with some herbs. And then I'm just going to whisk. Now, you can make vinaigrettes ahead of time and store them in, sque in squeeze bottles as well. Okay, so we have our vinaigrette. Taste it, make sure that it's good. I make this in squeeze bottles and keep it in the refrigerator as well. So now we can put everything together. So we have our salad here. We're gonna add our chicken over the top, just like that. Oh, and I have some shredded carrots. That's another kidney friendly vegetable. And then over here we have our chopped veggies, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pour some of my vinaigrette 
directly into my veggies, get it all kind of mixed up in here. And then I'm gonna take a spoon and just kind of pour it over the top. Just like that. And then I have some vinaigrette in the bottom. I like my salads kind of juicy. So I'm gonna pour some more of that vinaigrette over just like that. And then there you go. You have a beautiful salad that is kidney friendly, number one. It's full of vegetables and fruits that are safe. There's no sodium anywhere in this recipe. Um, everything is low potassium, low phosphorus, and you have a couple of different seasoning blends as well as infused oils that you can try as well. So I'm just going to bend my camera up a little bit. There we go. And so basically what you want to always make sure that you're doing is trying your best to keep those things under control because they're one of the few things that you can control. I see a question here, can you use Mrs. Dash? Just make sure that it's low in um, potassium. Some salt substitutes can be higher in potassium. When Aiden was originally diagnosed with kidney disease, we were told not to use Mrs. Dash, uh, but I, I think they've changed things up a little bit. They've made some adjustments to it. So um, I would just make sure that you have talked to your dietitian about different brands that are safe as well, because that's a huge part of being able to understand how this disease works. It's being able to understand what you can use, what you can't use. You want to stay away from tropical fruits, bananas, mangoes, avocado, things like that. You want to stay away from processed meats, um, chips, he heavily processed laden with sodium snacks. Those are all things that you wanna do your best to stay away from. Um, I have a lot of resources on these things. So if anybody has any questions, you can always shoot me an email at chefsachet at gmail.com. All of these recipes are posted on my website, chefsachet.com. And so I just wanna encourage you all to put in that extra effort to understand this disease, whether you're a caregiver or, where you, or, or whether you're a patient, um, and try some different things out. Um, at the end of the day, I mainly want you to remember that you cannot change your diagnosis, but you can change your diet, okay? Hey, thanks a lot, Chef. I appreciate that. And I'm glad we got the question about uh, Mrs. Dash, because mm -hmm. you know one thing that makes kidney disease so difficult to deal with is you can do some things that seem like they would be healthy, you know, and yeah. they would feel like you're making right choices. But the, because the disease, the disease is so complex and there's so much to deal with, even some healthy things really aren't good good choices for you. So I, I appreciate you for answering that question. I thank whoever gave us that question. Now I want to bring in Mark. I'm sorry. Now I want to bring in Mark to join us and tell us a little bit about his story. Mark. So hey guys, how Mark, you guys doing? Good evening. So tell us, what was it like being an amateur boxer and then getting this diagnosis? Um, I went from fighting in the ring to fighting for my life overnight. Uh, there was no, there was no, uh, no question. It was the hardest punch I've ever taken. Um, putting on gloves to now putting on medications. This is what it looks like. This is the first three months of actually being diagnosed with kidney disease. And... Um, I tell people, what did that feel like? And they ask me that all the time. And I say, you know what? It's really the hardest punch I've ever taken. So what was your, what was your, after you get the initial diagnosis um, and, and hear what the possibilities are, what, what were your next steps? Well, I only had two options at that point. So they said either I get on dialysis or I find a kidney transplant. This thing perspired on my 26th birthday. Um, that's when my actual diagnosis was. And it actually lasted for about eight years, right? Um, FSGS for me was a slow progression. I just had a lot of protein that I was urinating. 
And um, essentially that's what led to me getting on dialysis. And the way I found out, or actually me as a group, my fiance also um, helping me is she found me on the floor. My body completely passed out from having so much toxins in my body for not flushing my body out that I ended up passing out on the floor. She found me, woke me up and we went straight to the ER. I knew that day I was going to end up on dialysis because prior to going to that hospital, I mean, I exhausted my creatinine levels. Uh, the time I got into the hospital, I was 20.5 my creatinine levels. And, um, I just ran it through, man. I, 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 I ran my kidneys till the wheels fell off. Yeah. That that's amazing. You know, um, I had a neighbor who was a doctor and I remember I was t talking to him uh, about a week before I was to go for my transplant. And uh, he, he said to me, yeah, you know, when your creatinine gets over three, you know, over three, it's hard for, you know, it's hard for you to get out of bed, out of bed some days. And I looked at him and I, man, my creatinine was about an eight or something at, at that point. So yeah, it, it really was very difficult. And it is one of those diseases that, People from the outside don't necessarily know what you're, you know, what you're going through. And in adults, we may not physically manifest the way they do with with children. Right, right, right. And and here's the thing about that, right? You, I get a creatinine level at twenty point zero. The upside is I feel great. The downside is everyone else is telling me I look great and I felt great. So I couldn't really tell the difference, right? I mean, even at eight, I was still trying to train and be physically fit. So I couldn't really notice a difference. And the only thing that I really, that gave it away was the foamy protein in my urine when I would urinate and how tired I would be. I mean, I would take a, I would, I would go to sleep around 10, wake up at six, go to work and have to take a nap by 12. I mean, a two hour nap. I mean, you know, before I was like, oh my God, I'm still tired. What's going on with me? Yeah. So what's that like for you, Chef, when you're dealing with your dealing with son and I guess having to having to notice the symptoms for him or, you know, pay attention for him? I, I don't know. What is that like for you on your end? Yes. So I'm. it's so funny um, that you mentioned falling asleep, because even with remote learning, Aiden's like, nodding out every couple hours and i'm like going in to check on him keeping him awake keeping him full of ice water like drink something just to get you through your math class you know so i think what is something that i've had to realize is that his tiredness and his sleepiness was also linked to his hemoglobin and how when you have kidney disease your your hemoglobin is constantly dropping um, especially with FSGS. And so we learned that, you know, his dad would always joke and say, the count needs his blood, which is when we knew that he needed a, a, a blood transfusion. Um, and it sounds so crazy, but it was one of those things that we learned like, okay, if he's tired and if he's falling asleep in class, maybe when we go to labs, we need to have them check his hemoglobin to see what's going on. And so I've kind of used those type of things and other symptoms to really understand, okay, this area in his lab work is slacking. Let's get this back on track. And then he's full of energy. He's vibrant. He's full of life. He can get through the school day, um, whether it's an epogen or ARNS shot or whether it's a full blown transfusion. So I think it's really important for caregivers to learn what to look at. If your child or whoever you take care of is always falling asleep, always nodding out, make sure that their hemoglobin is where it should be because that's oftentimes a symptom of that as well. Okay, that's, that's pretty interesting. And Mark, tell me this, because I, uh, like I said, I, I definitely enjoy listening to uh, the chef segment because I like to cook. And I, I like to exercise, but uh, especially COVID has really affected my exercise re regime because I, I can't go to the gym. Uh, I don't know about other people, but for me, due to the medications that we take, uh, getting up and going outside first thing in the morning for a three mile run or a 10 mile bike ride just does not work. So how did, how did the, the exercise change for someone who 
clearly had a very active lifestyle and was in great shape being a boxer. You know, the first thing I asked my doctor uh, when I went through transplant and went through all the different teams, right? So I went through five different transplant teams because everywhere in the nation, a different wait time for every state that offers kidney transplants, right? So I was in California, Vegas, Arizona, Baltimore, Maryland, and New York. So I wanted to make sure that if there was a kidney transplant that came up, O positive, and I was a match, that I'd be getting getting that call, right? But that also came with a high level of responsibility to always be on time on when the next flight was going to leave and where was I going to stay and which hospital was going to take me, um, or not hospital, I'm sorry, um, hotel, which I was going to take me for the next three weeks and how was I going to pay for that? Right. So it, a, a lot of that stuff played a key role to what I was doing with, with my care. And um, to as far as exercise went, that was actually the first question I asked my doctor was once I get this transplant, when is that next time I'm going to be able to get up and, 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 and do my thing, whether it was running, lifting weights, anything that had to do physically. I wanted to know when I was able to do that. Um, Google isn't your best friend. Everyone comes in as a, you know, uh, you know, some people hire, get, get, get um, completely healed in six months, eight months. Um, I started to really progress at a month and a half in, right? Um, I did my first mile a month and a half out post kidney transplant. And then I started to work my way up from that, you know, um, and I started to eat a lot more, you know, you, you they, they put you on 50 medications and expect you, oh, well, you know, make sure you manage that diet. I did that so long while I was on dialysis yeah. that it was a sense of freedom when they were like, go ahead and do your thing. And yeah. and I had to learn that because you get on prednisone, you, you start to eat a lot, your emotions go up and down. And I was never like that. So for me, it was a month and a half. And then after that, I started to slowly progress to get into weight training. And then I slowly progressed to doing a 10K. Okay, I did a 10K. And then I slowly progressed to doing a 50.5 uh, mile bike ride. Cool. You know, and this is all within a year and a half post kidney transplant now um, for my new journey. You know, uh, my, my kidney transplant uh, nurses and doctors were like, they were very impressed because I got up 12 hours after surgery, they said, you do seven laps, we'll get you out of here. You can't tell somebody who's competitive to do something because I'm going to go and do it because I want to get out of here. I had a catheter in me. I had all these different all these different needles in my arm. I wanted to get out. I, as quick as I wanted to get this transplant over with and I started to feel better, I wanted to get out. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's an amazing journey okay. for sure. Yeah, so you're, you're obviously a very motivated, like you said, competitive person. And and uh, chef sachet. I'm gonna I'm gonna get that right. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, you have to care for somebody. So, how do you guys take care of yourselves emotionally? A therapy. I said, how do you guys take care of yourself emotionally? Oh, um, yeah. Therapy. Okay. Therapy, and Aiden's in therapy too. I am an advocate for therapy because you know what. Sometimes you need to talk to somebody and you don't want to talk to anybody you know. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you, you want that unbiased opinion um, and you want to be able to talk to somebody who is going to coddle you when you need to be coddled, but also is going to give you some tough love when you need it. So I, we're both in therapy um, and we like lean on our family a lot in terms of just, hey, guess what? I can't get through this if I can't talk to you and you're crying the whole time. So I need you to kind of be mentally tough for me in order for me to be able to express to you what's going on with him and explain to you the plan that I'm working on. So it's a lot of that. It's also, I love talking to other parents and other caregivers that are in my situation. Um, when Aiden was diagnosed, I met um, Kelly Helm of Nefcure through a, a Facebook group of parents. And I realized that um, Aiden was in a rare situation 
with his kidneys failing so quickly, none of the treatments plans working, including dialysis, because he also suffers from hydrocephalus, which is another, it's a condition where you have water on the brain, your, your ventricles and your brain produce too much fluid. So when you have kidneys that don't work, your body cannot absorb the fluid from the brain. So I have, he has these two medical conditions that literally work against each other. And I just really learned to find comfort and solace in other parents that were going through it because we can get on the phone, we can cry, we can vent, we can get it all out and then we can, then we feel like recharged and we can go back into the world and, um, and take care of these kids. So my biggest things are therapy, your family being mentally strong for you, his father, his, his father's family, my family, um, our significant others and their families being really mentally strong for us. And then finding your tribe, finding that network of people that are in your situation that can relate, that you can let those things out, you know, that you may not feel comfortable talking to other people about. Yeah, I, I definitely can relate to that. Yeah, I found, um, I found therapy to be very helpful to me, especially because, I, you know, I'm opposite of a lot of people. I didn't do a deep dive on information about FSGS. When I, when I went to, like you said, Mark, Google is not necessarily your friend. And when I went to Google, I found a lot of information uh, or, or narratives from people who were having the worst possible time. And I knew that I wasn't. I mean, I, like I said, it was, never, it, was, it was never not a struggle, but I knew that I was having an easier time than other people. Um, and when it came to my friends, one, because I'm a typical man, I didn't necessarily tell anybody about it. Like I didn't tell my friends until I had to tell people that I needed a kidney. So I can't necessarily blame them, but sometimes, you know, in a situation like that, people don't know what you need and they don't know how to give you, you know, they don't know how to love you. They're just trying to, and they're not always, you know, Say, you know, say, not always saying the right thing, but they're coming from a good place. So for you, Mark, did, did, were you open with people while you, you know, before you got to the point of being on dialysis or did you keep, did you keep that tight all the time? Um, you know, in all honesty, Kevin, I found out through this whole journey that vulnerability was my best friend. Um, and the reason why I say this, right, is because I kept digging myself in a hole. I because you think you're alone. You think you have no one to talk to. I couldn't go to a therapist for me personally, because I didn't think they could relate to what I was going through. Mm -hmm. So looking at my journey now as a whole, I had my diagnosed uh, group of people who were in the same realm of that I was in stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. And then I had my um, ESRD patients and dialysis transitioning and then i had my transplant patients right and they were all different um spectrums of advice right that got me through my day-to-day -day living you know uh and getting through the kidney process i learned that people want to help they just didn't know how i had people who were there who were financially there for me i had people who were there who were emotionally stable there for me and i had people who were there who wanted to give me a kidney right so in, 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 in all honesty, I had to talk more to patients because I wanted to know if this were to happen, which you've already went through, what steps can I take to not get into that deep hole that you already went through that you can shed light on me for, right? Um, being on dialysis, something that I learned a lot about was um, eating uh, ice, uh, cut ice, so that I can limit my water intake, right? Um, because I would, lo I love water. I mean, I, I grew up drinking a lot of water. I, I learned how to always stay hydrated. Um, so going through that portion and saying, how do I lower my phosphorus? I'm already doing that. Um, this is, this, I, you, they tell you in, in um, what is this, dialysis, you gotta take three of these phosphorus pills. And I don't know if you guys know what they look like, but they're really, really big. Can you see that? I mean, you can yeah. see that, right? So I had to take it every time every, at, at every meal. So if I needed to eat a fruit because I'm because I wanted something sweet, I needed to take a phosphorus binder. If I needed to eat lunch, 
another phosphorus binder. And I'm not talking one, I'm talking three, four at a time because I'd start to itch at that point because my, you know, dialysis takes out a lot from you. Um, but again, post kidney transplant is not the, you're, you're completely cured. It is right. a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a cure to the very, the moment or what, what would you say a kidney transplant is? I would, you know, I would say it's a, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a, a fix for a problem. Right. But it's, but it's not a cure. Right. 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 So I know that it's not a cure, right? I know that it's not a cure. So how do I prolong keeping this kidney for as long as I can? You know, uh, people ask, well, what motivates you now, now that you got a kidney transplant, the people who got 35 years with that kidney. You know what I'm saying? That's who I want to be because I've already went through the hardship. You know, what success can show you, rock bottom can. I learned the best me at my very downest time, right? And and this transplant now is now my motivation to how do I live that best life? How do I stop taking this many medications all over again, right? Mm -hmm. Um. So So that's how I was able to get my word of advice when it came to my journey in kidney disease and, 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 and just smiling every day, like genuinely, like checking in with myself and making sure that I don't, you know, I stick and move any emotion that's going to knock me out. Right. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's cool. I, I have to admit, you know, I didn't get comfortable with the vulnerability. Actually, I did not get comfortable with the vulnerability until maybe a month before my transplant. Wow. And, um, my, you know, when I found out that I was going to get the transplant, I, well, one, I, I didn't allow myself really to believe it till, until it was about a month away. And uh, so I'm a financial advisor and I started making some phone calls to some of my clients and letting them know what was going on. And I, I'm also a person, I really don't like a lot of attention at all. And uh, my friends were incredible. Uh, my friends and my family, they just surrounded me and gave me so much love, but I don't like attention, really. And so I'm getting all this attention, but I had this conversation with one of my clients that, I, you know, and it just, I, I, she's a very wonderful person, but we had never talked on this level. And she said to me, she said, you know, when we think about the story of the Good Samaritan, everybody imagines themselves. But if there's no traveler suffering, there's no need for the Samaritan. And sometimes you get to be the Samaritan and sometimes you have to be the traveler because that's when people get to know and find out exactly what they have inside of them. And uh, I, feel, I actually am proud of the experience that my friends had taking care of me and being around me and my family because they really did you know, I, I intrinsically knew that they would be there like that for me, but I don't know that they knew how they could come together for me. So it really, you know, it really was a wonderful experience for me. And we got one question. Somebody said, you know, what would you tell uh, someone older or someone who doesn't trust dialysis or, or medications? What would your message be to that person? Is, is, is that? Yeah. Either, yeah. I'll, you, I'll start with you, Mark. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so the question was what? Sorry, I got I, I was it's, I was I'm sorry. It's, what would you you know what would you say to someone who is maybe older or someone who doesn't trust dialysis or medication? Or someone who doesn't trust medication. See that that was uh medication for me, or dialysis. Right. So that's what my lifeline was. I needed to get on that. I, I knew it because my I can feel my body really decreasing, right? It, it's how do you feel about your situation? You know, uh, do you want to prolong this to, so that you can try to get a kidney? You got to look at all the aspects of, am I still within the age range of being able to get a kidney transplant? Um, how do these medications work for me? Um, I took all these medications and in all honesty, it was just a lot of water that I took so I can just keep flushing that out. You know, a lot of, a lot of my things was is, is water, water, water. Get that medication so it can do its job, but just flush it out as quick as possible is is my my word of advice. You know, uh, I know some people don't believe in that. They want to go the holistic route, which is something that I tried doing. But at the long in the long haul in this in this race called FSGS and battling it, mm -hmm. I lost me personally. Right. Because I did end up on dialysis. I did end up 
with a kidney transplant. And, you know, it, it, it's on a case by case basis. And that's what they say about this, this illness is we got to take it by a case by case basis. Yeah. And how, so, and how do you deal with that? Uh, um, so what I would tell, you know, an older American or an older person, first of all, the medication regimen that you start on is not where you will end. As the disease progresses, as your body reacts to certain medications, you need to make sure that your medical team is paying attention to your body. So right. if you don't trust the medications all, right off the bat, that is totally understandable. Your medical team, their responsibility is to find what works for you. Um, and Aiden's medication regimen has changed over the years. Um, and we finally landed on a couple things that work for him that make the medication aspect of it easier. Um, in terms of dialysis, dialysis is rough, no matter what way that you slice it. I cried many nights watching Aiden sit through dialysis and cry and vomit and have to go to the ER. And just, it was a miserable, miserable time but I knew that he needed it to get to the next step. And if you can try your best to keep the end goal in mind, which is life, then that might help motivate you to, um, to, to go through with it. Because dialysis is not great, but it's not the end of the road. And so if you can try your best to just stay motivated and knowing that, okay, this is where I'm at. I have to accept it and I have to make the best of it. Um, you can control the medication part a little bit more by doing research and really talking to your doctors um, about what questions, um, not what questions to ask, but in terms of the medication, ask them really what it does. What other medications in that drug class can we try? Because this is making me way too sick, you know? You can you have a little bit more wiggle room with the medications than you think you do. Talk to your doctors, and if your doctor is not listening, find another one. You know you need something that works for your body. Sometimes we can't trust the process. Sometimes we just have to trust God and trust that this medical team that we work with is going to help us figure this out. So uh, that's that's the best advice that I could give. Yeah. Dialysis is going to be terrible either way. You know, and I would um, and I, I, you know, I would echo a lot of what they said. I, I you know, as I said, I feel like I was very fortunate. Um, I had I, it took me for going to four doctors, just primary care physicians to finally get to a doctor that I felt like I had a dialogue with and that we tr that that was really listening to me. And then when I got to my nephrologist, um, I was very fortunate. I, I still have her as my nephrologist. Uh, we have a very, we have a very good relationship. And and one thing, you know, one thing about FSGS being a rare disease that does not have a a set process for treatment is the truth of the matter is your doctors do not know one hundred percent what you have to do, what what they need to do. Everybody's a little different. We don't have a set treatment for this disease. So you can. I mean, I would discuss with my doctor. Okay, well, tell me about this medication. I don't like. You know, I, I, I'm a financial advisor. I need to have kind of energy during the day. I'm not taking a medication that's going to harm my energy. Um, but at the same time, if we're if we're negotiating about the medications, then that meant about my labs. I had to be diligent about my diet. I had to be diligent about my exercise. So. You know, the great thing uh, about that relationship that I had with my nephrologist is when we got to the point. So in 2015, when she told me it is time for you to tell everybody, that was it in the story because she had negotiated with me on other things from time to time. And there was some medication because at a certain point I had to take this medication uh, to deal with the phosphorus that were either phosphorus or potassium, I don't even remember, but it was like, almost like this chalk that I had to drink. It was just horrible. Oh, Aiden had to take that. Yeah, yeah. 
But <laughs> because we had a relationship and we had negotiated, when she said, no, this is it, that was it. Um, so if you can, I would say, you know, keep looking for doctors. And I know that's a financial situation to a certain extent uh, and an access to healthcare situation, but find a doctor that you trust and, and, and work on a plan together. Question, what advice would you give someone with kidney disease who is feeling alone and depressed? And I'll go, I'll get that one to you, Mark. Oh, th th this is my favorite one right here. Uh, this is an amazing, amazing question. Reach out. Um, reach out to anyone dealing with kidney disease and learn about all the aspects that they have learned through the journey, right? Um, that was one thing that I, I, I was very hesitant to doing in the very, very beginning. But after I started to get my role and understand what I was going through, hey, my doctor says my, my creatinine level is at this point. What am I to expect? Or my phosphorus levels are going up to this point. What am I to expect? So many patients are willing to share their story to make you not feel alone. And that, that is real, real life. You know, I made, I made the best friends and in, in, in all honesty on social media, you know, Hey, give me a direct line, give me a call, you know, whenever you're down. And, and, and I took their word for that because I couldn't call my friends and saying, Hey guys, um, I'm urinating too much. Um, what does that mean? They'll be like, uh, you're just drinking a lot of water, bro. You're, you're good. Just, just, just keep doing what you're doing, you know? And then I would talk to somebody else who was also urinating a lot. And they said, man, you're, you're leaking a lot of protein, you know, um, cut back on this, cut back on that, cut back on, on certain things, you know? And, it, and it's just a, it's just a conversation, right? Like if I'm telling you, Kevin, how did you feel when you woke up, when you had that kidney transplant, you were like, wow, I appreciate the second chance at life. You yeah. can re, re you can regulate that moment. Right? Yeah. So, Every time I talk to a patient, they're on that same level. They're on that same understanding where they, where you believe what they're saying because they're in that same journey path that you're going through. Some might be ahead of you, some might be behind you, but everyone there is willing to help you and push you forward. And, and if you fall down, you lift your hand up and then they'll pull you up. That's what this community is about. You know, I talked to, to, to the CEO of, of the Neftur. He said out of 15,000 nephrologists, only 300 specialized in FSGS and nephrotic syndrome and all those rare kidney diseases. You know, I was blown away by that. You know what I mean? Because it all made sense to me. I seen 20 nephrologists. Not everyone had a different way of trying to treat that, but no one would tell me an exact answer. You know what I mean? So I was always yeah. on fluster mode. You know, I didn't know what to believe. But when I would talk to these patients, it was just like, wow, I'm at ease with my understanding of what I'm going through. Yeah. And I would say to somebody, you know, keep in mind that the, you know, we chef Sashay talked about, you can't control your diagnosis, but you can control your diet. Um, you, you have to try to control your stress level as much as you can. Yeah. You have to see things that relax you, things that calm you, things that please you. If they're, you know, so for me, I love, you know, this, this segment was so great for me because I love to exercise to clear my mind and I love to cook primarily to, to show, to share love with people. I get that, you know, from my mother, my house was the house that everybody on the block could come to and always get a meal. So, you know, that's, a, so those things that bring you joy, you know, embrace them and just know that it is a difficult journey. If you feel like it's kicking your butt sometimes it's because it is and that is a sane reaction but you know reach out like like mark said there are people that will uh help you and uh chefs that say we got a question can you give us some tips for shopping at the grocery store as well as eating out yes okay so then i'm so glad that i have this question because when i tell you that grocery shopping has become a sport in my house okay so what I do is I try, I don't plan every meal, um, but cause I'm in a blended family situation. So with sports and kids and doctor's appointments, I can't plan everything. I try to, but what you can do is plan a couple meals that require similar ingredients, but maybe different seasonings and spicings to limit how often you have to go to the grocery store. So for example, like this recipe today for this salad, we had chicken, bell peppers, um, lettuce, 
cucumber. I'll, I'll say, okay, I'll write out my grocery list and I'll say, okay, what else can I use this lettuce and chicken for? Taco night. Boom, that's another meal that I'm using the similar ingredients for. Okay, I have nectarines and I have cucumber. I can make another variation of a salad with that. Or I can pair this with some chopped broccoli and maybe some, um, some pasta and make a pasta salad with it. Do your best to try to plan a couple meals a week that require similar ingredients but taste different so that you can limit how often you have to go to the grocery store. The, the dried herb section, the fresh fruit section will be your best friend. Try to stay out of the processed meat section. Try to stay out of the snack aisle. I remember when Aiden was first diagnosed, I was like, listen, we're all low sodium up in here. I was feeding for potato chips, okay? I was like eating snacks in my car so that I wasn't eating stuff around him. So uh, trust me, it can be really, really hard. In terms of eating out, that is something that we reserve for special occasions because you can't control what a restaurant puts in their food as much as you want to. Um, so what we do is we limit how often we have like takeout, like McDonald's or anything like that. So that when we do eat out, when we have a family dinner or if it's a birthday and we order food or something, he can indulge in that moment because he doesn't get them very often. Um, and you can kind of use that if you're a caregiver, you can kind of use the eating out as a reward tool. I would sometimes say, okay, Aiden, we've had a really great two weeks. We've been doing what we're supposed to do. Tonight it's pizza night. Let's 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 make it happen. Still try to stick to the diet, but you know, take those moments um, because that's also a morale booster. Being able to indulge in those moments. Um, Aiden will be 13 this year, so he um, he understands the disease a lot more now than when he was eight. Like he couldn't understand why he couldn't have French fries. He'd be like, "But French fries is." is life, you know? So it's like, how do I live without this? It's like, we don't have to live without it forever. We just have to take it in strides. So try to organize your grocery list, um, use the same ingredients for multiple recipes to limit how often you have to go um, to the grocery store. And then try your best to use eating out as a way to reward yourself or to reward, you know, your family for doing a good job. I'm telling you, it is worth not having pizza for a month for that one day that you can let your child pig out and have at it because their labs look great, their sodium is down, they're not puffy, their blood pressure is under control. I live for those moments when Aiden can like be a 12 year old and have right. those things that he likes. So. Um, whether you're a caregiver or not, try to limit those things for special occasions because it can really be like a morale boost. Yeah. And so, Mark, when you were, you know, at the stage where, you know, um, in the, you know, dealing with dialysis. Well, well, one, tell me this. Did you train still while you were on dialysis? Yes. hundred percent. There's no question. Okay. I, th that was also my, that was my therapy. You okay. know, um, I needed to put on some gloves and I needed uh, to to punch a little bit. You know what I mean? I there are people love to talk. I just love to handle my business on the punching bag. You know, um, that was my best friend. That was all I knew growing up. And and um, uh, yeah, I, I I knew my body enough to know that if I worked out for more than thirty minutes, I would get my catheter in my chest wet. So I knew I only had 10, 15 minutes to go as hard as I possibly could okay. to get whatever frustration, depression, anxiety, all that stuff out on this bag. And then and then just make sure that I didn't sweat like I would now or, or pre pre all of this stuff, right? Um, mm -hmm. I knew my body at that point, you know? I knew that doc, if if I did this, will I have any, is there a benefiting factor that uh, that, you know, that this doesn't get wet and how do I keep this secured so it doesn't get wet? You know, they, they scared me, you know, they, they were like, yeah. look, when you got that catheter, you get that wet, you're going to end up coming back cause it's going to develop infections. Um, again, I also did that. Well, doc, well, can we do this? Can we do that? I was always trying to find a way 
for them to just say yes so that I can do what I got to do. Right. Um, so yeah, so that's, yes, I did yoga. I did yoga the five minutes right before transplant so that I knew that when they opened me up, I wouldn't be as sore. So I opened up and did a up dog, down dog and did every type of stretch prior to going in. Cause I knew I was going to be out for about four days. So yeah, I mean, yes, a hundred percent. I worked out. That's cool. That's funny. Cause uh, chef Sashay and I were talking earlier today about her son and her wanting to do exercise and we, and I said, well, have you tried yoga for him? Because he can't do things that are too strenuous. Right. But, right. Yeah. Right. But, yeah, so yoga, dude, yeah. yoga, yoga is an amazing, an amazing outlet, right? Um, it, it focuses on the breathing technique. I didn't, I thought I knew how to breathe because they always told me exhale when you punch or, or you throw a shot. But when you get to this yoga and you're doing all these positions and you're breathing in, inhaling positivity, exhaling negativity, I mean, it's a good foundation for the mind. That's what really got my mental six pack going when I was getting ready for that for that transplant. You know what I mean? So 100 yeah. percent do yoga, have them do yoga. Flexibility is key. Um, uh, you know, that's that 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 incision is going to, you know, it's going to have to heal. But you want to make sure that, it, that, that that it's able to. To be flimsy, you know what I mean? Not not so tight, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. I'm definitely going to have him start doing yoga because we met with the cardiologist and they only want him to do low impact aerobic type exercises right now um, because his heart has experienced some stress with the years of blood pressure medicine. Yeah. Um, that's one area that attacks Aiden specifically, keeping his blood pressure under control. And so I would have never thought to have him do yoga. I don't know why I never thought to do that, but I love that. I'm definitely going to have him start doing that uh, because you're the proof in the pudding that you can still exercise through this whole transition. Both of talking to both of you gives me hope for my son growing up and managing this disease. Right. This is amazing. I, I'm so thankful that you were able to come on and, and, and give us that insight on food. I still want to know more about food. You know, I don't know it all yet. I mean, this prednisone has got me on the next level of, 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 of you know, it, it has definitely got me on that next level. I gained about, I was 135 when I got on my transplant. I'm 170. I gained that much weight. I mean, wow. it's just, you know, so yeah, I mean, this is, it's definitely a journey. You know, yeah, yeah, it, it, it definitely is. I was saying, you know, I before before uh, I mean, my weight, weight has fluctuated because of, you know, I had high blood pressure and, and on the medications and everything. But I would get wider. I wouldn't necessarily get the gut. So now for the first time in my <laughs> life, I have this. Gut right. And it's it's a bear and it's big. And and, uh, right. you know, something about, you know, and, and people don't really care about telling the guy he's fat. Like right. people just be like, nah, dude, you know, you're fat. Well, you do. And it, that's not exactly what I want to hear. And I also don't want to be like, no, you don't understand. I have a kidney <laughs> there. There's a lump because I, yeah, you know. Right, so, right, right, right. It, it's, a, it's always something, but I know that I've been very blessed to, to even be in this position. And uh, I know, you know, I just want to try to be a blessing to other people uh, the same way that you two are. And I really appreciate you guys uh, being here. We're a little bit over an hour in. Uh, I don't know. Can we? Can someone tell me in the chat where we're going? No, no, no. Well, okay. Well, this is a. Uh, it's time for us to wrap it up. Seth Shashe, Mark Cornell. I want to say thank you to both. Uh, Chef, your uh, your your web address and where oh, we can get information about you. Okay, you can go to at the bottom chefsashay.com. It is up and live. These recipes for this for the salad dressings and the seasoning blends are on my website. You can go to chefsashay.com to the blog section. It's right there. This salad recipe will be posted this evening. Um, so look forward to that. And then you can always email me. I chefsashay at gmail.com. Find me on Instagram at Chef Sachet. So anywhere Chef Sachet, you can Google and you can get in touch with me. Um, okay. This and is so much fun. Thank you. And Mark from the Kidney uh, Fighter Show, give us a little plug. Yes, it's markcoronel.com. Uh, talks about my journey every day. I interview a lot of different patients on there. 
um, specifically their specific battle, that moment in time. And, and we just go and dig deep into that mental, mental mindset, right? We're trying to create uh, mental six packs in the journey of kidney disease. So, you know, um, I can't develop that here. So I have to make sure I get that up here so I can be completely honest with myself that I got something, something up there that's, that's working like a boxer. You know what I mean? Yeah. I love that. Well, I want to thank both of you. Uh, I want to give a plug and a big thank you to Black Health Matters, uh, the crew there, Trevere Therapeutics, uh, Kappa Alpha Psi North Central Province, health, Healthy Kappas, Healthy Communities, and Nefcure Kidney International, where I'm a board member. Uh, please go to nefcure.org uh, if you need information about FSGS, kidney disease. Uh, we have a, a website, Kidney Health Gateway, that will help you find one of those 300 specialists uh, who, who really have a good understanding of treating FSGS. Uh, thank you guys again, this was wonderful. I knew it would be because you two are just kind of like a personality. I, I really appreciate you and I want you to continue to be blessed and continue to be a blessing to the others. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, thank you guys so much. Thank you. All right, you guys take care. You too, thank you. Bye. Yeah.